Hello everyone, welcome back to Introduction to Philosophy. This week, we're going to be discussing the philosophy of gender. Specifically, we're going to be looking into the metaphysics of gender. So, what makes someone one gender versus another? Okay. We're going to be looking at two articles to help us explore this topic. The first, from Elizabeth Barnes, literally called The Metaphysics of Gender, uh, in which she's going to explore the variety of positions that there are on offer, and consider what the strengths and weaknesses of all of them are. All right. Second, we'll be looking at an article by Robin Dimbroff and Dee Payton, where they'll try to take an altogether different approach and trying to somewhat change the strategy we're using partially away from the metaphysics of gender. Let's start with Elizabeth Barnes, and so the metaphysics of gender. Now again, the central theme of her project is going to be to attempt to find an answer to this question, what makes someone one gender and another person another gender? I mean, what is it that explains someone's gender? She begins by claiming that it's pretty clear biological sex is not going to do the job of allowing us to discriminate neatly between genders. Another way to put this is to say that biological sex is not going to be equivalent with gender. And this is true for a variety of reasons. First, she argues, biological sex does not actually very neatly divide into just male and female. There are plenty, there's plenty of room in between, the idea goes. And you might see this with someone who has like XXY chromosomes, etc. Right. So the fact that these sorts of people exist shows that sex is not actually binary. Now, what's the point there? If you think that gender is binary, that there's men and there's women, and that's really it. Um, then looking at biology to do your explaining is not going to cut it. Right? You cannot have an identity relationship where one thing is a category of two and the other thing is a category of many. Right, that just won't work. Okay, so the typical argument against this kind of position is to say something like, well, look, people like intersex persons or persons with certain syndromes that lead to these chromosomal abnormalities are not the norm, right? And these aren't things that we should be structuring the concept of biological sex around. They oughtn't be included, right? They're not the norm. Uh, I think that that argument is going to have uh, a rough time of it, right? You have, to you have to establish that these things are abnormalities, right? That these things are not normal. That being intersex, for example, is not to be counted within the division of biological sex. And in order to do that, you're going to need to have some kind of argument for establishing very clearly some kind of norm before you even look at the biology, right? Well, look, there can only be man and woman, and therefore intersex uh, doesn't get to count. Like, okay, well, you need an argument for that, right? So it's not necessarily the case that that's an impossible argument to make, but it's not clear um, how that way forward is going to go. Okay, right, so second, she wants to say that, look, some people, especially intersex people, can have all of the external physical characteristics that we typically associate with one gender, let's say with being a woman in this case, um, is treated entirely by society as a woman, right? And thinks of themselves as a woman, but nevertheless has XY chromosomes. This happens in the real world, right? If you are someone like a biological essentialist, who we will talk more about when we get to Dimbroff and Peyton, uh, you're going to end up having to say something seemingly ridiculous, like, despite the fact that they look like a woman, they are treated like a woman, they think of themselves as a woman, they aren't really, right? Well, then... What is this concept even doing? You know, what is this concept even doing if all of the ways in which it's used are denied 
because you're holding on to something that we can't even really ground that well, like a chromosomal difference that defines or determines some kind of binary in really strict terms. Okay, so a little more on biology. She thinks even if gender is not, strictly speaking, identical with someone's biology, we do still have to acknowledge that biology plays something of a role, right? Because biology can impact your physical appearance, right? And your physical appearance is often used to make gender care, uh, categorizations. So here's a quote from Barnes. Maybe people will think that you're likely to be nurturing or likely to talk a lot or likely to be emotional or likely to be particularly good at organizing, but not that great at abstract reasoning and innovation and so forth. The particular assumptions can vary a lot from place to place and time to time. The main point is just that people's perceptions of your sex characteristics are deeply socially significant in a way that people's perceptions of your eye color or shoe size are not. All right, so the point is, even if gender is not equivalent to something like biological sex, the public's perception of your biological sex is still going to play some kind of role in how the public ends up treating you where gender categorizations are concerned, right? Okay, nevertheless, Barnes thinks, it's still pretty clear that biology doesn't explain gender differences. And to make the point, she considers historical uh, examples, right? So she says, quote, during the 18th and early 19th century, the greatest heights of emotionality were thought to be the preserve of men. Women, it was thought, were not capable of the same depths of feeling as men, to the extent that the declaration that women feel just as much as men feel in the novel Jane Eyre was considered genuinely shocking. Right? So the idea that Barnes is trying to push here is that, look, these gender categories evolve over time and context from place to place and from time to time. If you think that gender is totally determined by biological sex, you're going to have to provide some kind of explanation as to why these kinds of categories evolve and these kinds of categories stay relatively stable, right? Why is it the case that male and female sex remain somewhat stable while gender characterizations seem to frequently evolve. The two can't be identical, is what she's trying to point out here, right? Lastly, she thinks a purely biological account of gender isn't really going to help us talk about trans and non-binary folks, right? It's not really going to help us solve the metaphysics of gender where they are concerned, right? She thinks, like, look... It, it would be wrong-headed to use something like a biological notion of gender to deny these people their identities because we don't even really have some kind of stable conception of gender to begin with. Clearly, it changes over time, right? Uh, we're going to see more on that point when we get to Dimbroff and Peyton. Okay, so moving beyond biology, um, let's talk about social constructivism. So, so a social construction is just something that society or people uh, have created to serve some purpose, right? Typically, these things are like norms, right? So there are norms for things like what's cool and what isn't. Norms for things that are fashionable or valuable, right? Um, who is beautiful and who isn't, right? These are all social norms, OK, so the idea is that gender might just be one of these things, you know, whether or not you belong to a certain gender is explainable in the same way that whether or not a certain kind of music is cool uh, or not. Right. They're the same kind of thing. So um, Barnes wants to say in some way that seems to be true. but We ought to be really careful here. Gender seems to be a special gender norm. I mean, gender seems to be a special social norm. And here's why. The idea of like being cool or not uh, is very amorphous. It changes from time to time, place to place. 
but it also hasn't existed forever, right? This idea of what's cool hasn't always existed. The norm comes in and sometimes it goes out, right? Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case for gender categories. So she, she acknowledges to begin uh, that there are in some societies gender categories other than man and woman, right? That sometimes you have third genders, maybe even fourth or fifth genders. Um, nevertheless, in every society, Barnes argues, we can find at least man and woman. So the gender categories of men and women seem to be incredibly sticky. They hang around, right, much longer than things like uh, coolness do, right? So they, they might be a social norm, but if they are, they're a special kind of social norm. Second, she argues, they're a kind of social norm that is often used for the purpose of facilitating some kind of oppression against one uh, classification within the category, right? The same thing we're going to see next week applies to racial categories, right? These kinds of things, racial and gender categories, some argue are so stable because they facilitate oppression, right? We need some kind of tool in order to help us define some other, right? Because you don't want to do something harmful to yourself. You need to find some way of making someone the other. Then it's acceptable for you to not take them into account as much, morally speaking, right? So Barnes wants to make the case that another special quality of a gender norm uh, is that it's often used to facilitate some kind of systematic oppression where something like coolness is not. Okay, so there are going to be two positions here that take the idea that gender is in some way a social norm seriously. Uh, this is gender externalism and gender internalism. Now, why the difference between externalism and internalism? What does that mean? Internalism, roughly speaking, in this case, just means that what makes you the gender you are has to do with something purely internal to you. So it's like your feeling about gender expression or gender identity that makes you what you are gender-wise, right? Whereas externalism is going to say, you know, it also has to involve at a minimum, and most externalists will go further than this, um, the way society treats you, right? The way the world engages with you. It's not just about how you feel. It's about the way the world interacts with you. So let's look at gender externalism first. Um, what gender externalists are trying to do is find some kind of feature or group of features that all people within one gender have in common right? They're looking for something external to explain what makes a woman a woman, right? So they need to find those things that are in common. And quite often, this commonality is going to come down to, quote, the social experience of sex-based oppression. So for many gender externalists, what makes someone is, what makes someone is a, <laughs> what makes someone a woman is that they have experienced some kind of sex-based oppression, right? That society, having identified their sex characteristics and made certain assumptions about them based on those sex characteristics, then oppress these people. That's what unifies all women as women. Okay, so... Um, Barnes here really is going to just offload externalism onto Sally Haslinger, who's a very famous gender externalist. Um, and Haslinger gives us a very specific view, right? She argues that in order to be a woman, there are three things that have to be true. First, you need to be observed for the most part as having the sexual characteristics indicative of a female's biological role in reproduction. Again, this just says be observed for the most part as having right? So 
if society clocks you as uh, having certain sexual characteristics that identify you as female, uh, that's sufficient for one. Okay. Two, you must be in a position that those observed characteristics are thought by your society to place you in some subordinate position. So after those sexual characteristics have been recognized and they have been used to place you in some kind of role, the placing you in that role ought to be uh, for the purpose of subordinating you, right? The category of woman is a subordinate category, according to Haslanger. Lastly, these two things have to work in tandem to contribute to your oppression or your subordination. So for Haslinger, quote, gender is just this system that disadvantages people based on perceptions of female sex and a female's role in reproduction. Okay, so Barnes has a few concerns with this view. First, she thinks it problematically puts an incredible amount of weight on how people treat you. All right, so it puts an incredible amount of weight on other people's opinion. Barnes is concerned about cases like this. Imagine that someone externally presents very androgynously, but they identify as a woman. And let's say, for those biological essentialists still in the room, that they even have double X chromosomes. Okay? So we would say that they're a cisgendered woman, perhaps. Right. Nevertheless, they present externally in a very androgynous way. Well, if they're so androgynous that broader society fails to recognize them consistently as a woman, then on a view like Haslinger's, they might not qualify as being a woman. Why? Because you need to be clocked by society as possessing these particular sex characteristics and then that clocking has to be used to place you in some kind of category that makes you subordinate, right? And if, you're very, if your appearance is very confusing to society, that might not happen to you. In such case, maybe you're not a woman anymore, right? Now, Barnes thinks that's, that's clearly ridiculous, right? That, that's misgendering this person. Uh, and that's a serious concern about externalism. A second more theoretical concern that Barnes has with externalism has to do with imagined cases of women who are not subject to oppression or subjugation, right? So she has in mind a, a theoretical case like the mythical Amazonian warriors, right? A group of extremely powerful women who don't interact with men whatsoever within their society, right? It's a society of women only. Uh, well, in that world, you would not expect them to suffer from any kind of subordination or subjugation based on their perceived sex characteristics. And therefore, by Haslinger's lights, you might not be able to identify them as women at all. And Barnes thinks that's pretty clearly absurd, right? If the Amazonians existed, Barnes thinks uh, they likely would be women, right? So externalism, Barnes thinks, comes with some unfortunate consequences one seems to on one hand it seems to potentially misgender some people and two it seems to disallow for the existence of women outside of the context of subjugation and oppression okay so maybe that's good reason for us to consider gender internalism the internalist unlike the externalist wants to say that what makes you the gender you are has to do with how you identify, right? It's all internal. So if you identify as a woman genuinely, then you are one. If you identify as a man, then you are one. And the same goes for being non-binary, gender queer, etc. Right? If that's how you identify, then that is what you are. Uh, Barnes clarifies saying, quote, for the most part, when philosophers talk about gender identity, they mean your internally felt sense of your relationship to the gender norms and categories that are common within our society. Right Now, here she's really just re-expressing internalism, but it's important to recognize that there are some caveats here. Right, Look, you can't just identify as anything 
right? And it be true. Like you can't say I identify as gender X and you really now do belong to the category gender X, right? These categories have to be things that are recognized, are common within our society, right? So you are limited in respect to the choices you can make, even as a gender internalist. But at the end of the day, how you identify amongst the categories that are provided to you is up to you, right? Okay, now we there's there's much more like technical stuff to get into there. What makes a gender identity stable enough that it becomes a live option, right? It's um, there's a lot to unpack, but we have to move on. <laughs> okay, so Barnes also wants to make the point that look, uh, just because you might identify as a woman, for example. That does not mean that you have to think all of the present uh, norms about being a woman are good or fair or just, right? She wants to say it is possible for you to identify more closely with this gender categorization, despite the fact that you think maybe like Haslinger does, that being a woman comes with a lot of things like being the subject of subjugation or oppression and finding that to be an unjust state of affairs. It doesn't mean you are accepting all of those facts as good. Okay? It just means that you internally think it's appropriate for you to be identified with some category or other. Okay, so what's the problem with internalism, right? Because clearly Barnes is going to, being a very careful philosopher, uh, find some issues here as well, right? Well, the first thing, I think the most important objection here is that when you go fully internalist like this, you begin to potentially lose focus on what you're talking about, right? So the externalist project, recall, was attempting to find some kind of feature or list of features that all women had in common so that they could understand what it meant to say that someone was a woman. Well, if we're going to locate the determination of uh, gender identity with internal identification, we lose the ability to track meaningfully this category, right? So let me give you an example to make it more clear. I identify as a man. I think I have some kind of grasp on how society uh, has constructed this concept in the time and place that I occupy and whether I like all of those um, norms or not, I still feel internally like it's more appropriate for me to identify with that category than another. Okay, so I feel I have a certain feeling about the gender category man, it makes me identify with it. Now, let's say my neighbor, uh, who is also a man, similarly feels this way. He has a feeling about um, the gender norms that are ascribed to being a man um, and therefore adopts this uh, gender category. Here's the problem. I don't have access to his feelings. I don't know what it's like when he says, I feel like I'm a man. I don't know what that feeling is. I only know what my feeling is. And so when he says, I'm a man because I have these feelings about the gender categories, I can't know for sure that we're talking about the same thing, right? So if you go fully gender internalist, the concern becomes you lose the ability to talk meaningfully about things like gender categories. I might not know what it means to be a man anymore because we cannot share these intimate feelings with one another. Okay, the second concern that Barnes presents is that the gender internalist might also end up misgendering people on certain occasions. So here she has in mind someone who is like, severely cognitively disabled. The idea is this, if what makes you 
the gender that you are is purely some kind of self-identification, then that self-identification is likely going to end up being a cognitive process. At the end of the day, you are locking gender behind some kind of cognitive activity. And so someone who's very severely cognitively disabled might not be able to achieve any kind of gendered status, right? If they cannot make some kind of um, reasoned identification, then maybe they don't get to say, or we don't get to say, that they're a woman or a man or anything else. But, Barnes wants to say, this is problematic given that in some of these cases, these people will still clearly be treated as being one gender or the other by a broader society. We could imagine, she says, like a severely cognitively disabled woman who cannot herself self-identify, nevertheless be treated like a woman and all that comes with that by broader society. And if we do not extend our gender categories to capture situations like that, we are going to have a difficult time explaining the kinds of problems that she might face, right? So at the end of the day, it seems like internalism might also end up misgendering some people. Okay, so what comes as a result of this? Barnes is fairly convinced that gender doesn't purely have some kind of biological reality. It's in some way social, but as soon as you involve this social component, it becomes really, really difficult to pin down exactly what the nature of this thing is, right? In some way, it's very real. It impacts us in our day-to-day -day lives. So it would be silly, she and others think, uh, to dismiss its reality altogether. Nevertheless, we have to admit that it's really difficult to capture uh, gender categories, especially when we build in the fact that they change. They're not incredibly stable. They're sticky. They've been around for a long time. But what makes a man a man and what makes a woman a woman have not always been the same. And they, they do change, right? We're going to see more on um, more approaches like this when we get into the philosophy of race next week, next week. In fact, very similar strategies. But for now, let's turn to Dimbroff and Peyton. So their article is why we shouldn't compare transracial to transgender identity. For the first half of their article, they're going to try to address questions like Barnes's by trying to somewhat shift the narrative away from these more like classical metaphysical answers and more towards like a sort of socially informed answer, right? So let's see how they're going to go about this. The way they begin their article is by discussing Caitlyn Jenner's uh, revelation of her identity, right? Her transgender identity. They want to discuss primarily those people who objected to Jenner's self-professed identification, right? The point that they want to make here is that most of the people who were objecting to Jenner were saying something like, well, Jenner can't really, or she isn't really a woman because there is something that it is to really be a woman, and Jenner isn't it, right? So it's this idea, they're claiming, that gender is something set in stone, that there are some rules that in fact determine who is a woman and who is not, and that Jenner was in some way in violation of those rules. Right. That's what they think most of the people who were denying Jenner's identity were doing. That's the kind of position they were holding on to. Now, what they want to do instead is to suggest that that premise, that there are certain rules that dictate who belongs to what gender, are flawed. 
right? That idea is ultimately, they think, unfounded. There are not strict rules that determines who belongs to what gender. They are loose. Gender categories shift. And there aren't any kind of sticking rules, right? And therefore, this suggestion that Caitlyn Jenner isn't really a woman is somehow a conceptual mistake, right? No one can really be a woman because there are no hard and fast rules that dictate womanhood. Okay, now they know that this is going to lead them to some potential problems, right? Like if you're going to argue that we should accept transgender identities because gender at the end of the day is a social construct that is amorphous and doesn't have hard and fast rules, you might have to say the same thing about race, right? You might have to start saying that, well, because race is also a social category, we're going to see that argument next week, um, that it too is largely amorphous and that there are no hard and fast rules and that therefore we should accept people who express transracial identity. So they mentioned cases like Rachel Dolezal and Jessica Krug. I'm not going to get into the specifics there. Um, I encourage you to read up on them yourselves. Uh, but the, the things we need to know about their cases is that both women have claimed to be black despite having a total lack of black ancestry and having lived the majority of their lives as a white woman, right? Okay, so they want to say this is a potential problem, but there is a way to solve it. They are going to carve this analogy to show that there is a meaningful distinction to be made between transgender and transracial identities. And if they can do that, then they can continue on with their strategy of saying, well, look, there's no hard and fast rules about gender categorization, and therefore there's something wrong about saying this person isn't really a woman. Okay, but before they get into the analogy, they want to talk about potential resistance to their idea that there isn't something hard and fast uh, in, in respect to rules that make someone a woman or a man, etc. Right. Okay. So the first thing they want to do is say, look, um, social categories don't work that way. They don't have strict rules that can never be changed, right? Social categories adapt according to our needs and purposes. They give several examples. They say it wasn't until 1971 that 18 year olds counted as voters. So in this case, voter is a social category that gets updated in 1971 when 18 year olds are now suddenly able to vote, right? Uh, it wasn't until 2008 that those with bone marrow cancer were counted as people with a disability. So disabled person as a social category gets updated in 2008, right? And they go into whether or not creatures like octopuses should count as food, right? So you could say that food also is a... Sorry, my, my poor dog is struggling to get up on the couch. <laughs> you could say that food is also a social category. Some things it's inappropriate to eat, right? Like another human, for example. Um, while some things are perfectly acceptable, like a ear of corn, right? Or a leaf of lettuce, right? No one's going to object to you eating that, right? Well, that category can shift. It can fluctuate. There are no hard and fast rules. Maybe we start to see things like octopuses as no longer counting as food, given that we're learning more and more about their intelligence. They're equivalent in intelligence to something like a five-year-old, right? If you think that's morally relevant, maybe you start to think that, well, an octopus shouldn't really be counted as food at all. Social categories can change, right? That's the idea. Okay, so they say that's not going to be enough at the end of the day to support our position, obviously. 
Because you could say that race and gender are special social categories. They don't work like every other social category works. And we just saw Barnes make this exact argument. So there's good reason for thinking that this is the kind of resistance you would see. So they want to deal with uh, what they regard as the uh, largest competitor to the view that they're trying to express. And this is essentialism. Specifically, we're going to be talking about biological essentialism. Now, Essentialism just says that what it is to be a specific gender, you can also be an essentialist about race, um, is to have a particular biology, right? There is a particular biology, and having that biology makes you a woman. It doesn't matter how you feel about it or how society treats you. That is what you are. Okay, so they're going to give a few reasons for thinking that essentialism is false. Okay? So first, they're going to use the same move that Barnes uses um, by pointing to history to say, well, look, look at the way gender categories have evolved over time, whereas the biology hasn't really, right? Like, yes, biology evolves. That's, you know, you're going to have to have evolution for biology, modern biology to work. But within the course of human existence, we have not seen the biology of sex really change. We have seen gender categories and the norms associated with them change quite significantly, right? Second, quote, for any candidate biological trait, for example, having double X chromosomes, having female reproductive organs, producing female gametes, there are people who lack that biological trait. And yet many of us, gender essentialist included, would say that those people are women, Furthermore, even just within the last 150 years, concepts of biological sex have fluctuated in response to the discovery of hormones and chromosomes, growing medical knowledge of intersex variation, and changing social opinions that split sexuality from sex and move toward accepting the possibility of altering one's sex. Okay, so there's several ideas here. I'll talk about a couple of them. First, uh, they're going to... Um, make this point about the science behind these kind of like biological essentialist claims, right? That the science is not like something written in stone that hasn't changed over time. Our understanding of the biology itself has been changing. It wasn't the case, for example, that we always knew about chromosomes. And before chromosomes, which are the most popular uh, thing to index to when you're talking to a biological essentialist, like most of them are going to say what makes a woman is double X chromosomes, for example. Uh, those things have not always been an available tool for biological essentialists to use where the establishment of gender is concerned, right? So the biological understanding of sex is also evolving. It might not be as strong as you think it is. We are constantly, they argue, uh, getting an updated version. Things are changing, right? It's not written in stone. Second, a similar point to one we heard Barnes make. Uh, it is possible, and this happens every day, uh, that a person might fail your test as a biological essentialist and yet nevertheless be clocked by you as a biological essentialist as the gender that they identify with, right? So there might be a person who identifies as a woman and outwardly expresses themselves as such that all of society addresses and identifies as a woman as well yet who doesn't have two X chromosomes, right? That is possible. That happens all the time. And if that happens all the time, we have to ask ourselves, how much of a role is this biological understanding of gender actually playing in our day-to-day -day lives? Is this just an ad hoc sort of explanation for what gender is, given that we aren't even using it in our day-to-day -day lives, right? Okay, so race, they think, can also function similarly, right? So next week, we're going to see arguments that have to do with 
whether or not you should be an essentialist about race, whether or not there's some kind of biological reality uh, about race. We'll see some think that there is, right? Like we'll read Quayshon Spencer, who's going to argue that there is some biological reality to race. We'll also read others who say there's not, that it's purely a socially social construct, right? Nevertheless, uh, Dimbroff and Peyton want to say that all that they've said about gender categories being very uh, amorphous is going to apply to race as well, right? Who belongs to what race seems to change from time to time and place to place, right? Okay, so let's go back to the analogy. If we accept that there is no hard and fast rule for determining who gets to belong to what gender and who doesn't, and this leads us to accept certain kinds of professed identities like that of Caitlyn Jenner, do we then run the risk of having to include people like Rachel Dolezal, who want to make some kind of transracial identity claim? They're going to argue, no, you don't have to do that just because you honor transgender identification. And here's why. One of them ends up causing some harm and the other doesn't. All right, so what harm and how, we'll see, right? Okay, so they want to begin by making this note to be careful. They're like, look, um, we have to consider the harm that we would be causing the person who is professing an identity. So they make the point that um, if you do not respect a transgender person's identity, you do run the risk of harming them, sometimes significantly, um, when you fail to recognize someone's self-identification, that can harm them. And this might even be true, they think, for transracial identity. It might be the case that someone like Rachel Dolezal really deeply feels this way, and that denying her self-professed identity claim uh, harms her in some respect. That's possible. And we ought to, they're holding as a general moral principle, avoid harm when we can. But here's the thing. Sometimes we have to choose between levels of harm. So it might be the case that denying Rachel Dolezal's transracial identity is harmful to her. But if we do honor it, we might cause more harm to a broader population. And then it's, it's not worth it, right? Okay, so how could there be this broader population harm, right? Well, they want to use a specific case to show how this idea works. So they talk about the plight of the indigenous people of Canada. Uh, they mentioned the years between 1879 and 1996. So here they're talking about when all of the indigenous uh, children of Canada were forcibly enrolled in these schools that were more or less meant to convert, right, to assimilate these children into like a Euro-Canadian culture, right? All right, so children at these schools suffered tremendous abuse, and this system is largely held responsible for, quote, the prevalence of sexual abuse, alcohol abuse, drug addiction, violence, mental illness, and suicide in indigenous communities. And within recent years, we're also uncovering uh, a lot of premature death, right? Okay, so... Here's the thing. Um, Canada has recognized formally the harms that it has caused in this regard, and they have since started to offer some amount of financial restitution for those people who were effective, affected. Here's how a transracial identity can become harmful then. If you were to just decide that you identified as an indigenous person of Canada, even if that was not your background, then they think it's pretty clear you should not qualify for this financial restitution. Why? Because you have not been systematically harmed in the same way the indigenous people of Canada have been. You haven't been harmed in this way. Wait, what's worse is that you could end up harming the people who were actually affected by this unjust system by making it more difficult to appropriately identify those people who were affected by this system, right? If we start allowing 
many people to just identify, for example, as an indigenous Canadian, even if that is not how they were born, then it might be incredibly difficult for us to determine uh, after the fact who was one of these people who was adversely affected, right? It might be really difficult for us to get them the restitution that they are owed. Okay, so they think the same thing is going to apply for someone who wants to claim transracial identity uh, in respect to being black, right? They say being black in the United States is not simply a matter of internal identification. It is also a matter of how your community and ancestors have been treated by other people, institutions, and governments. In other words, being black in the United States carries a certain kind of history that has had an impact on those people, right? They have been subject to certain kinds of institutional harms. And if you just simply identify as being a black person, the strangeness is that you could not have possibly endured those harms, right? Given your transracial identity. Okay, so the harm then comes about because when you do this kind of thing, when you, as Rachel Dolezal or someone else, claim to be a black person through transracial identification, you're making it more difficult for us to uh, resolve historical problems of oppression, right? It's going to be more difficult for us to figure out who's actually impacted by historical racism in the United States, for example, when people are just freely deciding to identify however they like along racial categories, right? Okay, so what historical harms have black people in the United States experienced? Well, Dimbroff and Peyton give quite a few um, examples. Here are some specifics. They say that black people in the United States suffer decreased health outcomes as a, re as a result of social and economic adversity, and that wealth gaps between black and white households only widen intergenerationally. And so the idea is, if you have been um, oppressed economically for quite some time, uh, you're not going to be able to build up some kind of wealth to pass on to those who come after you. So this problem is going to compound itself. You should expect to find less and less potential for building up generational wealth uh, in the long run, right? These problems compound. Okay, so it's still not clear that there is some clean distinction between transgender and transracial identity along these lines. We have seen that transracial identity can cause some kind of harm. Can there be a harm for transgender identity? And that's what the question they turn to now. So the first thing they want to know is that, look, uh, it is also true that people of certain genders experience harm because of their gender, right? Like misogyny is a real thing, okay? Further, that kind of harm can be structural, right? There is structural misogyny. Women have been historically disadvantaged, okay? So, so far, all the similarities. Here's a meaningful distinction. The misogyny, even the structural misogyny that women experience does not compound intergenerationally, right? Yes, as a woman, it is likely that your mother also faced misogyny and her mother as well. But the fact that your grandmother faced misogyny does not mean that you're going to suffer even worse misogyny, right? That is not the case for these structural problems we see with race. So the argument goes. Okay, the stronger argument that I think Dimbroff and Peyton make is that uh, it doesn't matter if you have a transgender identification as woman or a cisgender identification as woman, you are still going to experience the same kind of harm in the end, right? So... The idea is you're going to face misogyny, even if you're a trans woman, right? You will end up facing misogyny. So unlike the case when we were talking about race, 
where a white person who doesn't face any kind of structural uh, oppression could identify as a black person and still not face any kind of structural oppression, you do not see the same thing with transgender identity. A trans woman is going to experience misogyny. And so here's a quote. There are certain forms of misogyny that trans women are less likely to face than cis women. For example, menstruation stigma. There are forms of misogyny that cis women are less likely to face than trans women. For example, trans misogyny. However, there are no universal truths about experiences of misogyny. Individual experiences of misogyny are deeply impacted not only by sex assigned at birth, but also by socioeconomic class, race, age, ethnicity, ability, body type, and geographic location. The point is, there is no one specific kind of misogyny. Women experience misogyny in many different ways, de determined by many different factors, right? But it's all misogyny. Therefore, we ought to include the harms that trans women experience because of their gender identity as another form of misogyny, right? It's all misogyny in the end. So they experience the same harms that cis women do, right? Okay, so that's ultimately what the meaningful difference is. It's harmful for someone to identify transracially because it makes it much more difficult for us to point to the people who have genuinely experienced some kind of oppression, subjugation, etc., based on a racial categorization. It clouds the waters, right? But that is not true for transgender identification because a transgender person is going to face the same kinds of harms that we would expect the cis people uh, within that gender categorization to experience, right? Okay, so on transracial identity then, quote, someone cannot make themselves more likely to experience intergenerational health and economic impact of systematic racism simply by identifying as black, nor can they escape it, right? So this is, uh, I'm here alleging to, or alluding to, um, a piece by Kwame Anthony Appiah that we'll talk about next week. Uh, you can't escape problems of like intergenerational, um, systematically enforced racism simply by choosing to identify as white. Right? You don't have that option available to you. These kinds of categories, racial categories, uh, seem to be um, much more um, sticky. Right? Okay, so at the end of the day then, Dimbroff and Peyton think that they have, one, argued successfully that we ought to sort of leave this discussion about the metaphysics of gender behind. Why? It's a social concept, and social concepts evolve naturally over time. It doesn't make a lot of sense, they think, for us to insist that someone isn't really a woman or a man when there is no well-defined, stable notion of what those things are. Okay? Um, they then tackle this potential problem that this would have to allow this this would force us to allow in certain kinds of things like transracial identities. Um, and they they argue, I think, relatively successfully, that there is an important uh, difference to be made between transracial and transgender identities here. Okay, so there's much more to discuss in the metaphysics of gender. Um, those who do identify to some degree or other with biological essentialism are likely not going to be satisfied with the two articles we read this week, but there are many more resources for them out there. Uh, but this is more or less the cutting edge of the literature today, right? This is uh, how most philosophers are engaging with the project of the metaphysics of gender now. Okay, so... Uh, that'll do for our very brief introduction to the philosophy of gender. Um, until next time, stay healthy, stay safe.